So good evening everyone, my name's Helen Hempar and I work for Devon Wildlife Trust as Urban Ranger on the Green Minds Project in Plymouth. Uh, so we're a partner uh, on this Plymouth City Council-led project and it's funded by the European Regional Development Fund's Urban Innovative Actions uh, Grant. Uh, and it's a great opportunity for the Wildlife Trust to bring our experience and enthusiasm for wildlife and nature to the green and the blue spaces of a large city like Plymouth. So Green Minds puts nature and wildlife at the heart of decisions made about Plymouth's green spaces. It's about making space for nature and helping people reconnect uh, with the natural world and getting all of the sort of physical and mental benefits that we know that this can bring. But this particular event is part of Devon Wildlife Trust's 60th anniversary celebrations, so extra special. Uh, so we'd really like to thank you for joining us. And um, we really couldn't do the work that uh, Devon Wildlife Trust does for Devon's Wildlife without the support of, of people like yourselves. Uh, and so any, any other information on future events you can find on the greenmindsplymouth.com website. Uh, but I will, as I said, I'll put a follow up email out after this and, and with any relevant information. And so on to tonight's main event, we're going to learn all about butterflies. Uh, and how we can help them, hopefully. Uh, and our speaker tonight is Jess from Devon Biodiversity Record Centre. So um, over to you, Jess. I'll let you share your presentation. Thanks, Helen. Um, oh, there we go. Yeah, that's good. You can see it. Lovely. Okay, well, um, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us, as Helen said, on such a, a beautiful evening outside. Um, so my name, as Helen said, is Jess. I'm the um, community ecologist with Devon Biodiversity Record Centre. And the Record Centre, we hold, oh, it's, it's millions and millions of records of wildlife across Devon. Um, but we need to always continue ask people to, to send in new records um, and records to, to keep everything up to date. So tonight I'm going to be talking about uh, butterflies, um, particularly butterflies that we've got records of in Plymouth. So Helen's already given a, a brilliant introduction to the Green Minds project. Um, and so one of the things is obviously um, challenging our existing attitudes and behaviours towards nature, how we think about it and how we engage with it. Um, and one way that, that I'm helping with that is hopefully um, by leading some training sessions and doing some talks like this online to really get people to, to not just sort of see nature but really know what it is as well um, and then hopefully record it too um, so we will be doing various things over the summer so do, do keep an eye out for those right so starting off with what is a butterfly we're going to start at the beginning so it's an insect um, we've got six legs multiple life stages two pairs of wings so they've got two fore wings two hind wings covered in microscopic scales and those, um, you can kind of judge the age of a butterfly sometimes by whether they, they wear off slightly. Um, they are nectar feeding, mostly. For the, for the sake of this, I'm going to say nectar feeding. Some of them eat um, honeydew and things as well, but predominantly nectar feeding. And they probably evolved around 150 million years ago. So they were flitting around amongst the dinosaurs. Now, worldwide, I think this is butterflies and moths because they are very, very similar. Um, over 250,000 species, which is just quite mind blowing, really. Um, and in the UK, we've got about 59 species. I'm going to say about 59 um, because that number can change slightly. Um, so that's sort of the basis. Now, having said that butterflies and moths are quite similar, we have two names for them. Um, and there's some sort of rough rules of thumb of, of how to tell one from the other. So butterflies active by day and uh, moths active by night. Um, butterflies have these sort of clubbed antennae. So when the, the antennae come out, then there's a little club on the end. Whereas in moths, they're not. Um, and you get the, you know, the big male moths with those huge feathery um, antennae as well, which, which butterflies just don't get. In general, um, when butterflies come to rest, they sit with their wings up together, erect behind them, whereas moths will sit with their wings out flat. Um, and then butterflies typically colourful because they're out in the daytime, so you'll actually be able to see colours, whereas um, moths that are out at night, 
typically drab colours. Um, they're sort of the browns and, and greys. But um, there are, of course, exceptions and quite a few exceptions to almost all of these rules. So day flying, day flying moths can be really brightly coloured. Um, I saw a Jersey tiger um, outside my house this week and just the red was just so startlingly bright, which is a, a moth. And then skipper butterflies tend to hardly ever put their wings up behind them. And lots of butterflies will, will sort of bask in the sun with their wings out. Um, so we've got, this is the, the skipper butterfly, which also looks quite moth-like, doesn't it? With this big fat hairy body. Um, but you can see the clubbed antennae here. And we've got, of course, the elephant hawk moth, um, which is just such striking colours for a, a, a moth, um, but no clubs on the end of these antennae. So the butterfly life cycle, um, I think everybody learns this when they're about three. Um, so uh, we'll start with, let's start with the egg. What comes first, butterfly or egg? Um, eggs are laid um, and then depending on the species, um, depends on where they're laid, how long they remain an egg for, but ultimately these eggs become caterpillars. Start off very small, as we all know, um, caterpillars are very hungry, so they munch their way through loads and loads of vegetation to grow and grow and grow, and when they get to the sort of um, bigger size they can then pupate, and when they pupate um, they'll build their um, sort of chrysalis around them, um, and they go through that absolutely magical metamorphosis inside where um, the caterpillar um, changes into a butterfly, it grows the wings. And then when they're ready, the butterflies emerge from the pupa. And they're, at first they're really kind of creased up. So they need to sit in the sunshine and pump blood through the veins in their wings to try and get those wings to stand out before they can actually fly. And then of course, um, we go around the cycle again. Um, and sometimes you can get more than one cycle in a year for butterflies. So um, there are a few that we'll talk about tonight that have butterflies, adults that are seen in kind of late spring. Then there's another generation um, in late summer. And I think there's a couple of species that might even be able to go through three generations in one year. So why are butterflies important? They are indicators of a healthy ecosystem. Um, so, for example, we can sort of extrapolate if we see that there are really good butterfly numbers that often suggests that um, other insects are doing quite well too, um, other invertebrates. Um, because butterflies have this sort of three stages of their life cycle, along with, with many of our insects and invertebrates have, have multiple stages, um, they require different things at different times. So knowing that a habitat has all those requirements in for a butterfly to be able to survive and, and a population to be healthy probably means that there's lots of other invertebrates um, that are also doing well. But of course butterflies are so much easier to spot than, than many of our other invertebrates. You don't necessarily need to go out there um, bashing it where the vegetation to, to try and find them. Um, you just need to go there on a sunny day and they'll just fly past you. Um, they've got quite short life cycles um, so they do respond to changes quite quickly. Um, so you can get sort of a good year and a bad year and it gives you um, the ability to kind of look at trends reasonably quickly. Um, they're a really important link in the food chain. So I'm, I'm, I'm swaying over to, to moths again, but um, can, I wonder if you've, you've seen the blank there, if anyone can guess how many moth caterpillars, um, blue tits, and this is just blue tits, will eat, estimated, and it's 50 million. So that is 50 million that are just eaten by blue tits. So that is, you know, if you think of how many eggs there must be laid for those caterpillars just to hatch, for ones not to be eaten by blue tits or, or anything else to be able to become um, adult butterflies. So they're, they're really important link in the food chain um, and, and one that um, there, there are so many invertebrates that are such brilliant links in this food chain which is why the Wildlife Trust are running the, the Action for Insects campaign as well, um, just to highlight the importance of, of some of these insects and invertebrates. So uh, on to groups of butterflies in Plymouth. So here I've got 58 species. Now I said it would change, and, and I'm sorry it's changing within the same talk. Um, 
there are some debates because we have um, migrant butterflies as well that come in to the UK um, that actually spend their um, overwintering um, right down sometimes North Africa and Asia. So we'll, we'll meet a couple of those later in the, in the talks. Um, so that's why there's a, a slightly difference in, in number. So I apologize. Um, they're divided into 10 families. And we've got eight of those families that I'm going to cover in this talk. Don't worry, not every single species in all of the families, um, just the ones that are seen in Plymouth and the ones that are most likely to be seen or of particular interest. So our first group, our first family are the skippers. So I've already shown you this picture. Um, this is the small skipper. Um, they're quite moth-like, really hairy bodies, quite stumpy wings, not the kind of sort of big classic butterfly wing shape. Um, both of these, these species, so, so all the species that I've got listed are ones that have been seen in Plymouth. So there are, um, there's for example, the Essex skipper, but that's not found in Plymouth. So all the ones that I've listed in this talk are ones that we have records of in Plymouth. Um, they've got quite a darting flight, just, just above the height of the grass. And they rest, as, as I mentioned before, with their wings quite flat. And at night, they'll actually curl their wings almost like around the stem of a plant um, while they rest overnight, um, which I assume is probably some sort of predator defense. Uh, so the small skipper really is quite small, only about three centimeters wingspan across. Um, the caterpillars, almost exclusively need Yorkshire fog grass. Um, so that is, um, Yorkshire fog is, is a lovely grass that's fortunately quite widespread, um, that looks almost silvery um, on the stem because it's quite downy and very, very soft um, with a lovely sort of purpley white um, flower head to it. So of course the skipper is found in places with long grass um, because the, obviously the caterpillars need to eat the grass, but then they'll need to um, have somewhere safe when they're an egg and when they're a pupa as well. So having the long grass and Yorkshire fog's quite good, it, it can form um, sort of decent clumps that really offer some, some safety and protection um, for the butterflies when they're, they're in their other stages. Um, the skippers are usually seen sort of late July, so we're not quite at the, at the time yet where they'll be out. And they overwinter as a caterpillar. So as I said, um, the, the butterflies, different species and different families tend to spend the winter as different, in different life stages. And these ones happen to spend it as a caterpillar. Um, this is quite a large family, um, the whites. They're kind of medium to large butterflies, generally white in color. Um, but they also include um, what's called the sulfurs. So that includes the, the brimstone, which um, I've seen quite a few of those this spring. The really, really sort of acid sulfuric yellow butterfly that's quite large, that, that is one of the first ones out in spring is in this family. Um, with the white, they often have um, black markings, um, sometimes a bit of orange, um, they generally overwinter as a chrysalis and they like um, plants of the brassica family, so that's cabbages. Um, this one in the picture here um, is the large white. Um, so both males and females, because you do get differences between um, sexes and butterflies, have this sort of black tip. Obviously we're looking at the underside of the wing, but if, if it had its wings open, you'd see the black tips. Females also have these black, whoop, black spots as well. So these are up to seven centimeters across. So if we thought that the small skipper was only three, so these are more than double. Um, two generations in a summer and over winter as a pupa. And these are the ones that you'll commonly find in gardens and allotments because the, the large white, their favorite food really is cultivated brassicas. So those are your, your cabbages and um, other things that you'll have in your garden allotment. Um, so that's what the caterpillars like to munch on. You probably all found those if you've been gardening. Um, this is a lovely butterfly that um, has the first generation has sort of been and gone, um, the orange tip. And this one here is a male. Um, again, both sexes have got black tips to the wings, but the male um, has got this really, really striking orange, um, 
which makes them really, really easy to identify, even when they sort of flitter past you quite quickly. They're the only ones that are going to be this white and orange colour. Um, the females don't have the orange, which can make them very, very similar to small white butterflies. Um, but they do look different um, underneath. So we saw the underneath of the large white um, before, and the small white's very similar. But the orange tip has got these markings underneath. So they do tend to sit and rest on things like um, in spring, it's like garlic mustard or hedge mustard um, along hedgerows and in slightly damp areas. Um, and when they do come to rest, you can really spot with this lovely sort of mottled markings that they have. Um, just to show you that whites are really quite tricky sometimes to, to tell apart, this is the green veined white. So again, very similar. It's got black markings at the top of the wings. It's got the black dots. But underneath, um, rather than just being quite sort of plain, it's got these um, sort of darker markings along the veins and they are slightly greenish tinged. It's hard to see here because the, the background is also so green, but they are ever so slightly green. Um, wingspan about five centimetres, so kind of similar to the, the um, small white. And you'll find it in similar places as well to the orange tip, so they're, they're, they will from above look very much like a female orange tip. So with that in mind, the fact that they all do look really quite similar, um, my advice if you want to go and look for butterflies like this is, um, well, catching them requires um, equipment and generally some, some experience and practice. So I wouldn't advise that everyone just goes out and catch butterflies in case you damage them. But if you've got some binoculars, um, you can actually just sit and then you can, you can see them when they're at rest when um, you don't need to disturb them, so they're not going to fly off. And you can zoom right in and you can really see what sort of butterfly they are. So I'd suggest suggest just, just sitting. I mean, it's not a bad thing to do, is it? Sitting on a nice sunny day with some binoculars um, and looking to see what, what species of butterflies there are. Um, if you do sit in a field, um, if it's a halfway decent field, you're almost certainly going to see a brown butterfly on a nice day. Um, these ones are small to medium, all roughly brown, apart from the marbled white here, which I'll show you a picture of later. Um, they've usually got a um, black eye spot on both sides of the forewing, um, often with white centres. Um, and then more eye spots are common sort of along the, the hind wings as well. And the larval food plants are grasses. Um, so this is a really common one. This is the meadow brown. Um, so here's that the eye spots. So with the black and, and the white centre, these ones are, are quite clear on this species. Um, the females are slightly more orange than, than the males, but you can see overall brown is the, the overriding colour. Um, these ones are really common flying over meadows. Um, they're, they're about, I, I've seen a couple so far while I've been out and about, but they're really going to hit their peak um, at the end of this month into July um, and through to August, um, where you'll see Loads and loads of them, probably. These are about five and a half centimetres across, um, and they do only have the, the one eye spot on their um, upper four wings. So when they when when they go past, they will rest. And these ones do quite like to sort of sit and fan um, fan their wings quite a bit. Um, there is this is the meadow brown. There is a hedge brown, which is similar, but it's got a whole load of rings along the bottom. Um, as I said, they, they, they really like um, grasses, for their larval food plants. So again, you know, having a nice um, meadow with really long grasses for the caterpillars and then having um, flowers in it as well for the adults is absolutely perfect place for them to be. Um, this is a lovely, lovely little butterfly called the ringlet. Um, so it's kind of, it's, it's colour, base colour is quite similar to the male meadow brown. Um, so obviously it, it's mostly the, the females of meadow browns that have the, the orange, but it's got more of these um, eyelets and it's got them along the bottom. And when it um, comes to rest with its wings up as well, there'll be some on the underneath. So that's the, the ringlet. Um, the adults feed on um, bramble and wild privet and generally more sort of scrubby areas than grassland. 
but the caterpillars still need grass, part of the, the, the um, Browns family. And they like the sort of coarser grasses, so um, Coxfoot um, and false broom, things like that. Um, and again, um, we're sort of going into July when we'll, we'll see those ones. Most of the Browns overwinter as a caterpillar as well. So this is the exception to the rule, colour-wise. Um, so it is a brown butterfly um, in family, um, but in um, colour it's actually black and white. So this is the marbled white, really, really beautiful butterfly. Um, you can see that some of the markings, they come through underneath, but it's still got these um, really distinctive classic um, eye spots that a lot of the others have as well. When they open their wings, that sort of black and white, almost sort of checkerboard between the veins is, is really, really obvious. So it is one that you can spot as it flies past because of the colouring. Um, these ones really, really like um, fescue, so red fescue. So that's quite a narrow bladed grass um, as opposed to some of the others, which like those sort of chunkier grasses. Onto the blues. Um, these are lovely. These are, um, I've seen some common blues out and about in the last couple of weeks. Um, well, a few weeks really. Um, they're usually quite small um, and they prefer quite open grassland. And the caterpillar food plants aren't grasses, they're wildflowers that you find in grassland. So bird's foot, trefoil, clovers, um, things like that for, for the blue family as a whole. The holly blue, bet you can't guess what that eats. Holly um, in the spring generation and ivy in the autumn generation. So that's one of the ones that has, has two generations in a year. And obviously, because they come out at different times, they need to eat slightly different things. Um, they all like quite open, um, sunny spots, but they're also sheltered because they're so, they're so small. So um, like wide pathways through meadows uh, where you might see them flitting about. So the, the males tend to be the, the really, really blue ones, the really strikingly blue. Um, this is the common blue. And a male. This is it's just such a gorgeous, gorgeous colour. Um, so they're small, three and a half centimetres. Um, they overwinter as a caterpillar. So this is the, the male common blue, and this is the female common blue. Um, so it's much, much duller, much browner. Um, you can see the these little eye spots that they've got along here as well. Um, on, they, they, they differ on their dorsal view, so that's from, from the top, but underneath they're both quite similar and they've got quite a white and um, orange coloration to them. So there's some of, some of this orange color that you can see on the, the females sort of is, is apparent on the underside as well. Whereas this is the holly blue. So, um, same sort of size, same shape, and again, the top and the males is really, really blue, but underneath, they look really different. Um, they're, they're sort of much, much paler, none of that orange. Um, the females and the males, again, they're, they're both quite blue, but the females have a much larger patch of black on the top of the wing. And these are seen from late April, so these are some of the ones that you'll see early on in the, in the summer. There's only one, um, one copper, small copper. Um, again, it's small, so it's the same kind of size as a blue butterfly. Um, and it's found on unimproved grasslands and moorland. So it's not a common one through the centre of Plymouth, but it is something we have had recorded. Um, so sort of around, around the sort of whole of Plymouth generally. Um, and these butterflies like sorrel and, and docks. So when I say butterflies, um, the caterpillars like sorrel and docks. Um, but this, the, the, the copper butterflies have got a really fantastic striking orange color. Um, hair streaks, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this one in particular, which is the white letter hair streak. Um, the purple hair streak we do have records of, but they are really, really quite old. So unless you fancy the challenge, um, going to look for the purple hair streak. Um, if you do, we'd absolutely love to hear about it if you find it. Um, it's the white letter hair streak that I'm going to concentrate on in this section. 
Um, hair streaks of the family are really quite interesting. Um, they're all quite small. Um, they're fascinating in that they lay their eggs at the end of summer and the eggs start to develop um, and then they, they develop quite slowly and it gets to winter and they sort of just press pause um, and then they resume in, in spring when it's warmed up a bit and then they so they overwinter as an egg which is quite unusual in our British butterflies um, so a small caterpillar comes out in spring um, and um, lives on um, its, its favoured food plant which is often um, tree species for this butterfly. So for the white letter hair streak it is elm. I've got another picture of it here. So you can see here that it's the the hair streaks get their name because they have a sort of a big streak on their their underside and this is the white letter hair streak because they, they basically have a, a, a big white W on their wing. Um, it's one of those very inventive names for a butterfly. Um, and these ones, I mean, you can see this, this is an elm leaf here, and it really is very small, it's a very small butterfly. Um, they are in the southwest really, really rare, and we are lucky to have a population in um, Central Park. Um, so there's, I think there's another population as well in Plymouth, but there's one in Central Park. Um, obviously, living on elms, um, this butterfly really, really suffered over the last few decades because of Dutch elm disease and we lost so many um, elm trees and even now you know when our elms try and grow they get to a certain age and, and they just they, they don't get any further um, which is unfortunate for these butterflies because they they're really loyal to not just elms but one elm in particular so because they need they rely on elm for their entire life cycle the eggs will be laid on an elm tree those caterpillars will um, grow up and live on that elm tree and then the adults will live on that elm tree um, so occasionally you get a little bit of a, a mix if there are populations near each other and occasionally they'll come down from the tree um, and forage on um, other species such as um, I think it's thistles that they're quite fond of um, but other than that they, they really do stick on their tree quite quite loyally um, but we're very lucky to, to have a, a population in Central Park and there has been some um, uh, work from, from other Green Minds partners, I think that you can, you can go to the park and you can find out a little bit more about them. And again, if you, if you want to have a go at seeing these, um, you'll need some binoculars because the adults are very small and at the top of an elm tree and we'd love to hear about it if you do spot them. Um, there's only one fritillary um, within Plymouth, and that's because most of the fritillaries um, like some really quite specific habitat, um, and they're found on, on moorlands and more sort of areas away from, from the city. Um, but silver wash fritillary is a little bit um, more flexible, and um, I saw some last summer in um, Derriford, County Park in uh, Birch, Birch and Valley. Um, really, really beautiful. They're quite large. So they're, they're really, really striking, quite big, that fantastic orange color, which is typical of the fritillaries. Um, the larval food plant are, is, is violets. So that's why they tend to sort of be found along sort of woodland um, edges and, and the edge of sort of really rough, almost sort of more moorland. Um, grasslands. So um, silver wash fritillaries tend to be seen sort of towards the end of summer, so July and into August. But really, really beautiful butterfly if you do um, are lucky enough to spot one. Um, and then this, I'm afraid I've just had to call it other, um, because there's a whole group of butterflies that belong to this family. Um, there are some, um, this is the, the family that include some of the migrants. Um, so this one here is one of the, the migrants. This is Painted Lady. Um, most of these butterflies are quite large. Um, this one is um, a bit over five and a half centimeters. So it's actually one of the smaller ones from this, this family. Um, the caterpillars like thistles, 
So, you know, really important to have some, some little messy patches, various places, thistles for butterflies like this. You get two generations in a summer. So these are the migrants. So the adults will um, fly over, um, so late spring, and then they will have um, late eggs, caterpillars, and then there'll be another generation. And then um, I'm trying to remember now if they might even manage to squeeze in another generation, um, but it's different adults that will fly back. When I say back, these butterflies, um, they travel all the way from North Africa. Um, you find them overwintering in Central Asia and the Middle East. And then they come back and recolonize Europe in the summer. And I think that for, for a butterfly that's only you know, five and a half centimeters across, a small insect to, to travel the distances it does is absolutely amazing. And you do get sort of bumper years of this one and sometimes um, not so many depending on obviously all the um, climates and, and changes that, that may have faced on, on its way here. Here we've got um, one that I'm sure most people recognize, it's the peacock with these beautiful big sort of eyes on it here. Um, like most of these butterflies, it overwinters as an adult. So although it's these striking colors on top, when it folds its wings together, the underside are they're really, really sort of mottled, brown, camouflaged, really cryptic. Um, and that's because they, they spend their, win their winters as an adult and they want to be able to hide um, and camouflage. Um, they're ones that you might find in your loft um, sometimes um, overwintering. Um, I used to do a lot of bat surveys and we frequently find peacock butterflies in, in people's lofts. Um, they're quite large, they're seven, about seven centimeters across. And um, again, one that really needs a sort of little messy patch in, in gardens and places because the caterpillars feed on nettles. Um, I think this is the last butterfly actually. This is, uh, hopefully everyone recognizes this guy as well. It's the Red Admiral. Um, and this is another migrant butterfly. So large, over seven centimeters, this one. Um, and they will continue flying all the way through November or into November. Um, and this is one that, that maybe is why my total number of butterflies is, is slightly different um, because they think, um, they being butterfly experts, um, that they might now be overwintering in the far south of Britain, which um, I, I, I reckon that might be us down here, um, far south of Britain. Um, because it's getting mild enough um, for them to do that. So th this is um, a beautiful and striking butterfly um, that you can see. It's one of the last ones maybe that you'll see of the year and they're found loads of places. Again, the caterpillars feed on nettles. Um, so you'll get the, the, the generation coming in and then another generation, most of whom will be um, heading back across um, the channel to um, more southerly warmer climates for the winter. So, sorry, I feel like I might have gone quite quickly through that. Um, that is a sort of really whistle-stop tour of, of the sort of variety of butterflies that, that we see in Plymouth that we can see. But, uh, you know, maybe there's more. And the other thing that I, I didn't put on there is, um, how old some of these records are. So for some of them, um, the records are quite quite old and I know they're out there. Um, so it's, it's really about um, finding them and keeping butterfly records up to date. So we know, we know how they're doing. Um, if you'd like to record butterflies, there are various ways you can do it. Um, if you're really super keen, there are schemes such as the um, UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme where you can walk a transect on a weekly basis um, to see how butterflies are doing. Um, so you'd contact um, UK BMS for that. Um, butterfly conservation, do the big butterfly count in July. So I'd, I'd recommend taking part in that. That's quite a nice way, way to, to do a, a really simple survey and contribute to um, a fantastic um, amount of data. Um, you could do your own survey if you just wanted to, to sit down once a month or something, or just when you go for a dog walk. Um, 
and maybe just sit and do, do a count um, just for a few minutes regularly and just see, see what, you can, what you can find. And then of course, you can let us know about incidental records. So it really is, you know, whenever you're out, if you're walking through the park or, or you know, even down the road, um, you might see a butterfly and you can let us know. So um, this is from the DBRC website. Um, you can submit wildlife sightings to us. And we just ask, um, it looks like there's lots of boxes. It's all very simple. It's who are you? Um, what did you see? Where did you see it? And when did you see it? Is effectively all we need to know. Um, and then we've got also um, a way that you can submit um, records on iRecord, which is a recording app. So for anyone who's keen on um, having apps on their mobile phone, um, then you can record butterflies and, and everything else as well that you want to, to send us um, through, through iRecord or on here. Um, so what does the future hold for butterflies? Um, butterfly Conservation, who are sort of the, the national charity and the experts, um, last produced um, their document, which they do sort of every few years, called the State of the UK's Butterflies Report. So that last one was in 2015. So I'm sure that another one is probably um, in process at the moment. Um, so and that showed that both specialists and generalists have been declining. So that's um, some butterflies, you know, are, are able to have multiple types of food plants, and and if their favoured one isn't there, they can um, make do with something else. So that's a generalist, and then there are specialists who really, really just need one larval food plant, or or things like um, like the hair streaks, who sometimes just live on one tree. But both groups have been declining. Um, Seventy six percent have declined over the last four decades, um, and then. With climate change, that is showing almost a bit of a mixed picture at the moment. So it seems like some of them seem to be doing better. So for example, um, the comma, um, which is a fantastic butterfly, and the speckled wood, which is one of the brown butterflies that um, I've seen loads of at the moment, out in the woods. Both of those have increased their range sort of further north throughout Britain. Um, as you know, things are getting warmer further north, they're able to, to spread up that way. Um, but we should probably also remember that over their entire range, it's probably getting much, much hotter in the south of the range and they're, they're losing ground there. So they're just sort of being pushed north to which of course one day there will be a limit. Um, and then there are some that initially really do look like they're sort of missing out. Um, not so for example not a species that we have in Plymouth one that you tend to find up in the Lake District and um, in the highlands of Scotland it's called the mountain ringlet and that as you can imagine lives on mountains and it goes up and up the mountain and things get warmer and it's going to run out of mountain um, so climate change although butterflies do like much warmer um, sunnier sort of situations um, there are going to be limits So what can you do to help? Um, recording, um, you know, from the record centre point of view, really, really useful. Um, really helps um, with where butterflies are seen and um, you can tell if there are years where they're doing well, um, really helps to contribute to sort of long-term data. So whether you are submitting just the odd record to us or if you want to take part in um, like the, the big butterfly count, um, it's really, really important for people to know where butterflies are because um, there's only so many places that, that a, an official recorder can go out and, and, and look for things. Um, if you've got um, a garden, um, then depending on how big your garden is, um, you can do things like um, leaving your grass long over winter, um, planting butterfly friendly flowers, um, and then even silly things like you don't you don't need to be too tidy in your garden. So come spring, um, don't be too hasty to start clearing up all those borders and things. Wait until temperatures are sort of nice and consistently warm, um, because then any um, caterpillars or other invertebrates that you disturb um, will probably fare better than than if they're disturbed when it's really cold. 
Um, if you're going to plant butterfly friendly flowers, there's loads of information out there about the different species. Um, variety is great. Um, and then planting them in shady spots and sunny spots. Um, so uh, overall it's variety is the, the, the key, I think. Um, if your garden is large enough that you can leave a patch, so maybe you can leave a bit of long grass um, all year, or even, you know, if, you, if you're lucky enough to, to live in a big enough garden that you can even have a section where you don't mind it getting a bit full of nettles, um, that would be fantastic. And of course, not using any herbicides or pesticides, because that is going to affect all, all, all stages of the um, butterfly life cycle um, and all insects. And I know that we may not be particularly fond of um, caterpillars munching through our, our cabbages. Um, I have lost a few plants to some caterpillars in my garden. Um, but overall, for the, for the benefit of seeing adult butterflies feeding around my garden, I don't mind losing a few. Um, so hopefully um, that's all sort of various things that you can do to help. And you don't need to have a big garden, even a window box or, or something um, where you can plant some nice um, nectar rich flowers can still help um, overall with butterflies and, and other species. Um, on the um, Devon Wildlife Trust YouTube channel, there's um, various other talks on butterflies and invertebrates. Um, there's one by Barry Henwood, who's a sort of local um, expert on butterfly life cycles. If you want to find out a little bit more than um, my very simple, um, sort of diagram that we did all see when we were in primary school. Um, butterfly conservation, as I said, they're the national charity and experts and they're, um, they've got so much information on all different species and really worth going to have a look at um, what they've got. And of course the Wildlife Trust have got information as well on identifying British butterflies. And we also have a um, lovely leaflet that you can download about wildlife gardening too, to give you some hints and tips about what you can do to help um, butterflies and other species of insect, invertebrate, birds, it all goes up the food chain. So thank you very much um, for listening and coming out on this glorious, glorious evening. Um, oh yeah, this final picture is a comma. I just had to stick that in at the end because it's, it's one of my favorite butterflies with this really, this raggedy edge is how it's supposed to be. <laughs> Um, but that's me, so if you have any questions after the talk that you completely forget to answer now, do get in touch. Thank, Thank you. you, Jess. Thanks. That was um, fantastic. Uh, it's always nice to see lots of nice pictures of butterflies, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, um, I feel like I'm sorry, I went quite quickly. But, no, it's um, good. There's so many butterflies. It, it leaves <laughs> us with about um, 10 minutes for, for, some, for some questions. Um, and just before, um, we haven't We've got a couple of comments, but not particularly questions. So if you think of anything, nothing's a silly question. Uh, we'll answer it if we can. Do pop it in the chat. Um, but what I was just astonished by that 50 million caterpillars fact. That's incredible. And to me, I probably would have said 100,000 or something like that. And to me, it shows how critical it is, doesn't it, to have as many insects, all sorts of insects, butterflies and everything else, to, to provide the food that those birds need uh, and obviously moths for you know for bats and things as well so um i just wanted to big up the devon wildlife trust action for insects campaign which is a really good campaign which uh you can sign up to on the wildlife trust website and you get a a, um, a pdf booklet all about um what you can do in your garden to help specifically to help insects and there's also a really nice section on the website all about gardening for wildlife so i'll send i'll try and send around as many links to things that we've mentioned as i can like the barry henwood's talk um and the id butterflies so don't feel you have to write everything down in a big hurry now um we'll send that down uh, and i just wanted to mention the, the way that I think Plymouth City Council are doing some great work on reducing their grass cutting over the last couple of years. And they've got a really good policy on it now, which you can look at on their website if you're interested. But by, by leaving loads more, you may notice if you live in or near Plymouth, a lot of the verges, they're cut a little bit on the edges for safety. 
but the, they've let the grass grow long and there's so many more insects around I think so that's really fantastic news and I wasn't really aware of the leaving the shirt overwintering so that overwintering that the butterflies so I do have a quick question before we get on to the other question is I've always thought butterflies had a very short life they didn't live for very long like some a few days but is that wrong and how long can they live um well they'll, they'll live less than a year so um the ones that overwinter will um they'll overwinter and then live sort of long enough to lay the eggs of the next generation and then it will be another generation that will overwinter i think okay so but yeah that's really interesting so i've got um someone who has uh, sent a link through about some butterfly walks and moth trapping events that butterfly conservation do so i'll definitely pop that round in, in the email but if anyone wants to find out they can look at the butterflyconservation.org website as well and events for that um and if anyone's interested in leading butterfly walks or moth trapping they could or, or volunteering with butterfly conservation there's a, an again uh, a link to that which I can send round. Uh, obviously butterfly conservation representative here tonight which is fantastic uh, and then also there's Devon Moth Group uh, I know Barry Henwood's a, mem uh, a member of that as well so um, there's moths as well don't forget the moths because we do have about two and a half thousand types of moths don't we um, Jess? Yeah we, we did moth trapping last summer in Plymouth we did a session in Central Park and we did a session at Pool Farm as well yeah um, so it's really interesting to see um what what we found there and we've got quite a few species not as many as pool in pool farm as we hoped and that is because um we managed to time it with the brightest full moon uh, <laughs> that we possibly could have found that um was unfortunately even brighter than our moth traps oh okay so and i've got a question here um is it okay to only use iRecord or do you have to notify other record officers so um, with iRecord, they go to a kind of central database and from there, um, other organisations and groups. So, um, for example, <clears throat> DBRC are able to access those records. Um, so that will kind of go to a central central place. OK, that's so if that's your favoured favoured route, then, yeah, stick with yeah. it. Thank you. Um, and if people there aren't any more questions I can see unless you've had any. I, I've, I've had a couple. Yeah, just before you you go through those, if if people were really always really keen, I will send out a link for some feedback uh, for a little survey after the event. But if anyone's got any feedback now for us, just pop it in the chat because it's really good for us to know if we pitched it right, if it's useful, if you're going to take any action as a result of our talks. Because if if you're now, well, I'm going to leave that patch of my garden wild then no, that's really fantastic news for us. So it'd be lovely to hear from you if, if you're planning to do anything differently. But yeah, Jess, what kind of questions um, have you got? I was, I was just going to add that, you know, yeah, if, you, if you're going to do something like that, it's great to hear. And also just um, to, to, to be aware of butterflies around you and, and record them is great. Um, so I've had uh, one question and one sort of comment. Um, so are more um, of those the migrant species coming over from Europe? um it's it's difficult to to say because it, they, it changes so much each year um depending on the weather conditions and things like that so um i know that with painted ladies you do get real so real bumper years sometimes um obviously we're we're sort of getting butterflies now that um particularly you know the, it's probably the southwest is um so so mild over winter that we're going to get to the stage where maybe they, they you know they can actually overwinter here as well um which will be quite interesting to to see um so i'm afraid i don't know the answer to that one um and then apparently um there's a blog article from um about the 2022 butterfly red list on butterfly conservation website so i'm going to go and look at that um because i do go on that website regularly but i obviously not spotted that one um yet so thank you very much um i've got another question yeah. here from um lilia who says i'd love to work with a wildlife trust in the future well that's good we haven't put you off <laughs> what made you decide to work in conservation and what sort of things do you do with your job 
Is that me? Yeah. Well, you could answer that and then I could perhaps say yeah. answer <laughs> so as well. Both, both <laughs> yeah. um, so I've, I've worked for the Record Centre for a bit over two years now. Um, I did a stint as an ecological consultant as well. And before that, I worked on various conservation projects, um, quite a lot of them abroad. Um, yeah, community ecologist is a brilliant role. Um, it's really fun, really diverse. Um, I get to go outside a lot. Um, today, um, I was out uh, i was telling helen actually um saw lots of butterflies and some lovely um like huge butterfly orchids as well um in a really beautiful spot in devon um doing a bit of training to some community a community group um yeah it's fab and i've just yeah i always wanted to do this and here i am so yeah, yeah. <laughs> well i've sort of similar i've always sort of loved being outside so that was a, really, a big bonus and also for me it's about sort of making a difference. It, it might only be a small difference, but, and obviously there's all sorts of global things going on, but we can't always do anything about that, but we can do something on our doorstep and we can all do that. And we don't have to make a career of it. You know, everyone can get involved with conservation and, and the sort of, you know, making space for nature all around us in, in our gardens and our, our towns and villages. So yeah, I'd say if you're interested in, the, in a career in it, then sort of get out there, do get do some volunteering and learn more, come, come to things like that, uh, talks and, and events and, and just learn more about it. And the more experience and volunteering you have along with perhaps some relevant qualification, then, you know, the more chance. It is a competitive industry, but I think it's when you're in it, that you're working with a lot of very like-minded people. So that's what makes it so enjoyable as well. Um, so ho hopefully that's a, a useful answer. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, that I mean, that's I think that's it for questions. So unless anyone's got any other sort of burning questions, but then please do leave us some uh, comments and feedback. But I will be following up uh, with an email with extra information. Um, and you can always then sort of get back to us if, if you need any any other information from us. Um, yeah, I don't think I had anything else to say, Jess. Anything else? Um, no, I'm, I'm trying to think. I don't think we've got any. Um, have we got any butterfly walks booked in this summer? Uh, green minds. Um, we've got. Well, we've got some other. We've got a wildflower walk, haven't we? Oh, yes. in, that Jess is, uh, and I'll be there. Jess is running in early July. <laughs> but again, take a look at Green Minds. I think it's early August. Oh, sorry, August is yeah. in early August. But and I will be spotting hope, butterflies as well. If we're looking at wildflowers, hopefully, yeah, well, if the weather's nice, we'll see some butterflies as well. So, yeah, yeah you never know what you're going to spot on these walks. And um, we've got um, uh, also in July, which is probably the one I was thinking of, um, an invertebrates event uh, with uh, John Walters, who's a really fantastic entomologist who, who lives in Devon. And he's we're getting him to come down and we're going to do some sweet netting and and look at all the bugs but I'm, I'm sure we'll hopefully see some butterflies then so there's lots of things going on and so the yeah the Green Minds Plymouth events page uh, and also if you're not local to Plymouth the Devon Model I Trust events page has, has lots of things summer's summer's the time for lots of these visits yeah. um, so hopefully we'll, we'll see some of you at those uh, and there's another if you're interested in marine wildlife we've got uh, another talk that's in July as well, which is with Paul Naylor, who's a, a fantastic uh, marine life photographer and expert. So that should be a really good one. And for the, for the online talk, that's an online talk. <laughs> so some, the other two are in person, but the online ones, you know, there's plenty of availability for those. So do join us if you're interested in seeing some incredible marine wildlife that we have around Plymouth and around, the, around Plymouth Sound. So yeah, I've got a couple of people saying thank you. <laughs> That's nice, uh, and come along to future events. But I think yeah, we're we're, we're finishing a couple of minutes early. Uh, thanks everybody for joining, um, and we and we hope you enjoyed it. Can I go back outside now? <laughs> yes, you can all get back outside in the garden now. <laughs> You're allowed. Thanks thank you very much. I'll just stop the recording there. <laughs>